It's question show time. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are on my channel, if a question pops into your brain, write it down on any video. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. Uh, again, stick around. We've got a guest question answered from the uh, American Astronomical Society meeting. So stay tuned for that. All right, let's get into the questions. Matt Higgs, if we detonated a nuclear bomb on the moon, could we see it from Earth? I think we could. And and I haven't been able to find sort of like a specific answer to this, but, but astronomers and just people watching the moon have noticed from time to time these little brief flashes on the moon. And for the longest time, nobody was really sure what was causing them. They called them transient lunar phenomena. And over time, people have realized that what we're seeing is meteors crashing into the moon and detonating and causing a bunch of like a flash of light. And the most extreme example is the obvious example was last year, there was a total lunar eclipse. And during the eclipse, one of these events happened. And so it was captured on camera by tons and tons of people, including me. I was live streaming the lunar eclipse. You got this brief flash. I didn't, we didn't notice it during the broadcast, but if you went back through my live stream, it was very obvious that it happened. And so astronomers, because this was so well recorded, astronomers were able to track this back and they found, they figure that something that was like this big smashed into the moon and it created a crater that was about 15 meters across. And when astronomers calculated how, what the force of that explosion was, they figured it was just a couple of tons of TNT, so dramatically less than the nuclear weapons that we have here on Earth that can be many kilotons, even megatons. So I think a nuclear explosion on the moon would be quite visible from here on Earth. It wouldn't be like this cool mushroom cloud, but you would there would be this momentary flash, and, and then maybe there would be other things that would be visible after that, depending on the size of the explosion. Obi modem. Regarding the Fermi Paradox, most videos on it seems to focus on possible future great filters. But in my opinion, it seems like the likeliest filters for intelligent life on other planets is behind us. The formation of life seemed to have happened as soon as Earth cooled enough to support stable life, but it took another billion years or so for eukaryotic life to evolve, and another 1.5 billion years after that for multicellular life to evolve. So this idea of the great filter, the gist is, is that you're trying to look for some reason why there isn't life out there. And if you're assuming that life is common, that whatever sequence of events went from non-life to life on any planet out there in the observable universe, uh, something stops it from turning into a intelligent life, or more specifically, something stops it from becoming the kind of life form that can explore and, and colonize and settle all of the star systems in an entire galaxy. And so we don't see aliens who have settled Earth, therefore life must be very rare. And this idea of the Great Filter is that there's some event that happens to all civilizations and it stops them from being able to turn into a star-faring civilization. And you can imagine some examples, right? There's some sort of planet-wide pandemic or an artificial intelligence apocalypse or some weird science experiment that turns the planet into vacuum energy. Um, but the other idea, and those are the ones that are in the future for us of the Great Filter, but the other idea is that they're in the past, that it was this distinction to go from, from single cellular organisms to multicellular organisms. And it was that, that jump, which you're exactly right, took a long time for Earth to be able to figure that out. And maybe that's the thing that has only happened here on Earth and nowhere else in the universe. And, and that's incredibly interesting. And, it's, and it seems almost certain that if we do find life out there, that most of it is going to be this single cellular organisms because it clearly took a long time for life on Earth to figure out this more advanced trick. And that does seem like a very satisfying answer to, to the Fermi paradox, just this, this version of the great filter. And the reality, of course, is that we just, we just don't know. We can't know until we can see another sample, until we can start to do these experiments where we can see other star systems and start to detect evidence that they have some kind of biological process going on them and then start to say, oh, okay, life is clearly common 
that will start to push more evidence that, okay, maybe the great filter was this jump from single cellular to multicellular. But if we look out into the universe and we don't see a single example of any kind of biological activity in any planet that, any, that we can see, then it starts to take us to the idea that, well, we are, maybe we're completely alone, that this is the only place in the universe that life formed or that we're first. It's a fascinating idea. As always, we just need to do more research. Bader Alarami. If we want to keep our DNA and information in orbit for the future generations, where would that be? This idea has been proposed a few times, that we take Earth life and we take it to some place off planet Earth and keep it safe. Like, the, you know, there's like a seed bank in Norway, but like that, but out in space. And in fact, uh, there is plans to send a lander to the moon that will have some, it's going to have, I think, all of Wikipedia on board. Um, now, the problem with being out in space is that you are exposed to radiation. Anywhere you go, pretty much if you're not protected under a lot of rock or water, then cosmic rays, radiation from the sun is going to break up any of that DNA and, and wear it down until it's just gibberish. <laughs> you know, just a, just a bunch of atoms. But if you can put that DNA and put it deep underground somewhere, protected from the cosmic rays, then it could last for a very long time, hundreds of millions, billions of years. And there are these perfect places on the moon. There are these lava tubes on the moon where they've got some opening and a big long lava chamber underneath and you've got many meters of rock in between that you could then go and put some samples in. And I'm sure that as soon as, I would say within the next decade or so, there will probably be a mission to just send some examples of DNA, some kind of time capsule to the moon, hide it in a lava tube, and then we know that if we wipe ourselves out, then the robots when they take over or the dolphins will find evidence of, of who we are, what we were, and sort of all of the life that we were able to preserve. And then maybe they can bring some of these species back and maybe even us. Dustman, could burned out red dwarfs or rogue worlds account for a portion of the dark matter? Yeah, astronomers have considered this idea that dark matter is actually just blobs of regular matter that we just can't see it. I mean, if there was a planet like Jupiter and it was a couple of light years away from us, we would have a really hard time seeing it. Like, think about how hard it is for us to search for Planet Nine here in the solar system. So, so that's definitely be considered as as one idea. But if the vast majority of the material of the Milky Way of the universe was rocky worlds of gaseous worlds, then that would have an effect that would be obvious. You would see it dimming the light from the regular stars, you know, collected into large enough amounts. You would, it would have an effect on the light curve, on the signal that we're receiving from these other places. Also, it's very strange the way dark matter tends to distribute itself in the universe. I mean, there are blobs of dark matter that don't have any stars, and there are stars that don't have any dark matter. And, it, and you would expect if stars and planets and you know chunks of material kind of form in the same way you would expect them to go hand in hand but astronomers are seeing big differences in sort of where the concentrations of the dark matter is and just remember right like like when you think about the mass of the milky way the vast majority of the milky way is this huge halo of dark matter that surrounds it and serves as like the anchor for the entire thing uh, that's what the Milky Way really is. We're just a small percentage of it. So yes, astronomers have thought of that. They've looked for it. And it hasn't turned out that that is the explanation that would help solve the mystery of dark matter. Drive Club is timeless. If it explodes, will it create a nebula? This is in relation to Betelgeuse, of course. Uh, and so if Betelgeuse explodes, uh, yeah, it will absolutely create a nebula. Uh, the best example of something that's kind of similar to that we have is the Crab Nebula, which exploded 1054 AD, and you can see this beautiful nebula. Now, Betelgeuse is way closer than the Crab Nebula. It's only 650 light years away. Well, the Crab Nebula is like 7,000, 6,000 light years away, so it's like 10 times closer. 
Um, and an example of what we would sort of see is Supernova 1987A, which went off, we're now 30 plus years since that supernova went off, and it's got this great sort of expanding ring of material as the light is moving through the, the shed layers of hydrogen that's, and, and material that's surrounding where the star used to be. And so we would see something like that for a while. We'd see this ring expanding as the light is moving through this material and once that light was gone then we would see this more faint nebula that would last for a thousand years so yeah it would be one of the greatest things uh, we would have in the night sky I can't, I can't wait come on it'll just explode already Todd Smith but don't expect radio communication ET comm system is quantum based how do you know how do you know ET hasn't figured out some kind of communication system that's way beyond quantum based? Like if, if anyone who like shows up and like uses radio waves or neutrinos or quantum entanglement, they're like, you know, that's old technology. You know, use your steam powered telephone, grandpa. So the reality is, of course, is that we have no idea what kinds of technologies are going to be developed in the future. Uh, but we know the underlying laws of physics that operate in the universe. And so it seems likely that if we were able to figure out the electromagnetic spectrum and how to communicate with it using radio waves and light waves, then other alien civilizations would do the same. Now, they might find it's a lot more convenient to communicate in other ways that we'll never figure out or haven't figured out yet. But it's also expected that they might maintain backwards compatibility with us and they'll maintain a beacon going in radio waves just so if we ever look in the right direction we'll see their beacon and go oh, okay you know here's the invitation to the galactic federation but we don't know it might turn out that in fact no matter what gets developed just according to the laws of physics radio waves are still the best way to send a, a cohesive communication to another star we just don't know controlled chaos Hi Fraser, what if we're wrong about water and ice on the moon? How much of a setback would that be? Astronomers are pretty sure that there is water ice on the moon at this point. Uh, India's Chandrayaan probe did a great job of mapping out where the water ice is. There's been follow-on observations and they're really seeing that there are these deposits of water ice on the moon. But the question is how hard is it going to be to get at? It's probably not going to be some ice rink, some frozen lake that's sitting at the bottom of a crater that you just come by and you just chip away at and, and turn into fuel and air and all the stuff that you require, it could very well be that it's mixed in with the lunar regolith and it requires a tremendous amount of processing to get this water out. We're probably never going to find a source of water that is as pure and easy to get to as something that's like, say, a comet, right? A comet is just like, it's just a big ball of dirty water, ready to go. And so really, we don't know how easy or difficult this water is going to be to extract from the moon. You know, we're starting to learn, especially with what happened with, with Rosetta, what's happening with Osiris-Rex, what happened with the, the Japanese Hayabusa mission, that asteroids themselves have a lot more water sort of mashed into their regolith than anyone was ever expecting. They're a lot wetter than people were anticipating, even though they're this close to the inner solar system. So even if the moon turns out to be a bad place to try and extract water, I think just because you have to go into a gravity well, it already is a bad place to extract water. There are lots of other sources for water in the solar system. So it'll be a minor setback, but there's lots of places for us to get water to sort of begin this first stage of exploring the solar system. Fernanda Baca. I have a question. Is it possible to find terrestrial planets around the oldest stars in the universe? I mean, those stars are mostly made of hydrogen and helium, right? Have we found any example of stars which have both low velocity and terrestrial planets around them? Thank you in advance. The first stars, they call, astronomers call them population three stars. I'm not sure why. Um, I, think I figured this out one time and now I've forgotten. Anyway, and so they are just hydrogen and helium and trace other elements left over from the Big Bang. And so when those first stars were coming together, they couldn't have terrestrial planets because oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, silicon, none of those things existed yet. It took those first stars to be able to fuse them in their core and then explode a supernova to start seeding the rest of the universe with these heavier elements. And now the next generation stars 
there there's sort of two generations that came after those first ones there's like the low metallicity stars these are the ones that just have like trace amounts of these heavier metals in them and of course astronomers anything heavier than helium is a metal um and then the the third generation the ones that we live in which are more mature and have a lot more and of course a lot more of these heavier elements in the 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 planetary disk that forms around them and so probably not with that first generation but with the, the second generation, astronomers are still looking, and they are finding examples of stars that are old and have low amounts of metals in them, but do seem to have terrestrial planets. So I think this is, this is still sort of an area of a tremendous amount of research, and so the more planets we find, the more this is going to become important. And I think, you know, we did this episode about, about the potential for, what was it, 100 million planets found by the year 2050. And of course, you're not interested in individual planets at that point. You're interested in the bigger numbers. And so astronomers will get to this point where they'll be like, okay, of this age of stars, these are the ones that tend to have planets. Of those age of stars, those are the ones that tend to have planets. And they'll know with actually a tremendous amount of precision when planets, like what amount of metals, metals it takes for a planet to first be able to form around one of those stars. And astronomers would love to know the answer. And right now it's still, still a mystery. Abdulrahman Shamud. Can we use neutrinos to communicate with Earth from the far side of the moon without any relays? So you're wondering, like, if we had some kind of science experiment that's on the far side of the moon, could it transmit the data to Earth using neutrinos? And then you wouldn't have to set up some kind of relay system. And in theory, yes, you could have some sort of nuclear reactor that's on the moon that you are generating neutrinos in some way that is then sending the neutrinos. They're going straight through the moon. They're going straight through the earth. You could be detecting them on the far side of the earth and you still would be able to detect them. And of course you could encase the, it in a light year of lead and you would still detect some of those neutrinos coming out of this, this reactor. But neutrinos are really hard to detect. They like there's a vast experiment in Antarctica, a square kilometer, a cubic kilometer of ice that is trying to find the neutrinos that come from the sun. And they don't get a lot of detections on any one day, right? It's just that, that they can detect some, which just prove that these things even exist. So we're so far away from being able to detect them. And that's sort of kind of their charm, right? Is that they're really hard to detect. And so they would be really hard to use as a communication system, as opposed to you put a second spacecraft in orbit and it relays the data and you're, and you're done. It's not that complicated. In fact, the Chinese have already done this, right? They've got a spacecraft at the far side of the moon, at the Earth moon L3, L2 Lagrange point, and it is transmitting data back to Earth. So it's much easier than trying to catch neutrinos. Ultimate Villager. What exactly is the relevance of knowing that there's life on some planet circling a distant star in another galaxy that we can never reach? If money for research is infinite, then sure, but it isn't. So why not concentrate on near Earth space, going to asteroids, both out of scientific curiosity and for their useful resources, which has a more immediate return on time and investment? This is an example of a false dichotomy, and I talk about this quite a bit, that, that you're like, these things are in space, right? Other planets are in space, and asteroids are in space, so why look for life in space when we could be sending missions to asteroids? And they're two completely different things. One involves building a telescope on Earth and then using that telescope to search various star systems out there to find out what's out there. Uh, and the other is like building reusable rockets and astronauts and mining and 3D printing and all kinds of other totally different technologies. So they are, they are not related to each other. So I don't see why you need to consider which budget. The question of like, why do we do it? Why should we do this? It's purely curiosity. And I actually replied to you in the comments and, and, and the example that I always give is like, if I could have an envelope and in that envelope, I wrote down the answer of whether or not there is life in the universe. So maybe even a more complicated answer, like, is there intelligent life? Are there intelligent civilizations in the universe? And I held, you know, closed up that envelope and I gave it to you. And if you open it up, you would know the answer to what is possibly the most important scientific question that humanity could possibly ask. Would you want to open it? Are you curious? 
right? If you're not curious, okay, I am, most people are, uh, we would love to know the answer to that question. So uh, they're just completely different things. Both are important and both require our, our effort. And so instead of choosing between searching for life in the universe and exploring asteroids, let's choose between, say, building aircraft carriers and exploring life in the universe or building aircraft or building stealth bombers and visiting asteroids. Like there's a lot of things that we could choose, a lot of budgets, a lot of money gets spent on things which maybe are detrimental to society, like cigarettes, right? That could be spent on exploring asteroids. So whenever you think like, why do this when we could do that, right? Think about the, all of the ways that money gets spent here on earth and then decide how you would like to portion out that money into the various options. Michael Ford. I would say look at what Starlink is going to be funding once it's operational. I mean, would you say it was worth it if we could launch Louvoir in, say, five years? I've heard a bunch of people give this argument about Starlink, which is like, SpaceX is going to be building this incredible infrastructure for launching things into space. They're going to have all of this money, and they're going to be able to donate that money to astronomers to be able to build telescopes. And... I mean, that's like saying like a trucking company is going to be able to make so much money that they're going to donate some of that money for people to build science experiments, right? Or shipping companies are going to have so much money that they're going to be able to donate some of that money to uh, build marine biology labs. And the reality is they're all just businesses, right? SpaceX is a business, and their business is to build this worldwide satellite communication system and they're going to use that money to fund sending humans to Mars and that's the plan and by creating this new infrastructure of rockets then it will absolutely change the way we access space and it will dramatically decrease the prices of launching teles giant telescopes into space absolutely no question uh, I don't think that SpaceX is going to do it for free right? Um, I think they're going to charge. They're going to charge reasonably low prices compared to every other option that's out there, but it's still going to cost you. So when you look at, say, a dramatically cheaper price of getting your telescope into space, ground telescopes still make, have a lot of advantages. There's just, there's not, there's something like being able to go over to your telescope, pull out a broken part, put a new part in, take a newly designed coronagraph, put it into your telescope and make observations. So it's going to be decades before we get to a point where we don't want to have ground telescopes anymore, if ever. So I don't think that that argument sort of really works. The argument that works for me with SpaceX is just humanity's going to get access to the internet and the terrible price that we're going to have to pay is that we are going to lose some of the science that we do from down here on the ground. And if humanity does get access to the internet, then for me, it's a price I'm willing to pay. And if humanity doesn't, and Elon Musk makes it just a bunch of money and spends it on fast cars and, and I don't know, sending people to Mars only, then uh, I don't think it'll be worth it. So uh, I, I love the idea of everybody on Earth getting access to the Internet and being able... I just think about how the, life, how the, how the Internet has changed my life. I do my job from Vancouver Island, and I'm able to do this work because I have access to the internet. You're watching this video because you have access to the internet. It is not our place to judge whether or not people should have the right to access the internet. The internet is, is everything. It's the most important now method of finding work and, and, and selling your stuff and, and being able to educate yourself and be able to watch YouTube videos. It really matters. So... If there's a way that people can get access to the internet, I'm all for it. And I understand that it's going to come with some compromises. But I'm not expecting Elon Musk and his SpaceX to do us any great favors and, and make it worth our while by giving us a bunch of free telescopes. It's, it's probably not going to happen. It's going to be a loss of the skies, and we're going to have to adapt and be glad that people can access the internet. Craig O'Brien. 
Will James Webb be a good scope for looking at closer objects and planets in the solar system, or is it designed for more looking way into the past? Thank you. Great question. Uh, and once again, we were at the American Astronomical Society meeting in Honolulu, Hawaii, and we went to the James Webb booth, and I pose your question to Amber Strawn, who is, works with James Webb, and here's our answer. The James Webb Space Telescope was initially, way back in the early 90s, designed specifically to find the most distant galaxies in the universe, to sort of open up this epic of space that we've never seen before. And we hope that it will do that. We're planning to do that kind of science with Webb. But the great thing about these enormous observatories in space is that they're capable to do a whole lot more. So with the James Webb Space Telescope, we'll also be able to study objects in the universe from that very, very distant part of the universe the early galaxies, all the way to objects in our solar system. So we will definitely plan to observe, and actually already have planned to observe in our early release science programs, planets within our own solar system. We're um, going to plan to look at Mars, some of the outer moons in our solar system, um, and very, pretty much the whole suite um, of the solar system from Mars on out. We can't look at anything any closer, any closer than Mars, but from Mars on out we will be observing. And then of course all that space in between our solar system and the distant universe, we'll, we'll be able to do that too. We'll be able to look at other galaxies. We'll be able specifically to study black holes in other galaxies outside of our Milky Way galaxy. And then, like I said, all the way out to the most distant objects in the universe. Thanks, Amber. It's great to hear right from the source. Uh, so this wraps up today's question show. Uh, as always, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops into your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. I'll see you next week.